This video is sponsored by Incogni, more on that later. Today I'm going to correct Wikipedia. Well, I'm not actually going to edit the page in question, the change would just get reverted, and I'd probably get an IP ban from the Wikipedia mods or something, those guys run a tight ship, but I am going to correct Wikipedia's account of something. About the end of the old Marvel animated show, Wolverine and the X-Men. Now, if you're a certain age, you may well remember watching this back in the day, and if you're younger, if you're an honest to god Zuma, maybe you've seen it too, maybe it's been recommended to you as a key part of that last great wave of Marvel animation. But either way, you probably don't know why the show stopped dead after one season, after 26 episodes, and the mother of all cliffhangers. No one does, really. Marvel never told us, they just quietly confirmed the show would not be returning after months of radio silence. Fans speculated, of course, they're still speculating. I asked some users in a related Discord channel what they knew about the show's end. Some wondered about the Fox-Marvel divide, whether that motivated Marvel to bury the show. Others suggested trouble with ratings, with money, maybe as a result of Disney's then new acquisition of Marvel. But none of this is confirmed, it's just rumours and fragments of behind the scenes lore spread by the still burning embers of the show's fan community. That's all I had to go on in my previous Wolverine and the X-Men video, which I made a few months back. When I mentioned the cancellation, I just repeated what I'd heard. Knock on effects of the Disney purchase, yada yada yada. This is even what the Wikipedia page says. but. That part doesn't have a source. And after that previous video went out, after it got some views, I started to hear more, and it began to seem like there was a story here. First, I got a comment from someone I later learned had worked on the show. I've since hidden it, since I don't know if this guy wanted to, you know, go on the record, but according to him, who we'll call Comment Guy, the show's eventual end was, quote, a lot more complex and politically messier than what was reported. And he summed up the cancellation as being over money and control. Not long after, I got an email from a different ex-crew member who wanted to talk, who'd seen that video and wanted to set a few things straight, and the picture he painted was eye-opening, to say the least. We had a really interesting conversation, and I learnt a lot about how shows get made, but when talk turned to the behind the scenes and the cancellation, what I heard came to align fairly closely with Comment Guy's summary. Things were messy, and when the end finally came, it wasn't just about funding. He did request to remain anonymous though, and hey, smart choice. On that note, actually, before we get into the info I received, let's talk about digital anonymity, and how today's sponsor, Incogni, can help you reclaim yours. We all use apps, websites, online services, and as a result, no matter how careful you are, your data's out there. You might sign up to a newsletter, then start getting more and more spam. You might hear about a company getting hit by a data breach, and even though you never did business with them, find out your data's somehow been leaked too. There's hundreds of data brokers out there, and they hold onto your information, stuff like names, addresses, phone numbers, your email, your employment history, shopping habits even. Ostensibly, it's for marketing, but it's not exactly transparent, is it? And as I'm sure a lot of you know, your data can and does get stolen from such databases online. Legally, they have to delete your data if you ask them, but even if you manage to track all of them down, send them the right forms, requests, it'd take literal years to get all your data deleted yourself. That's what Incogni does. It automates this process. You just fill in a few details and it goes off and scrubs the web, sending takedown notices to hundreds of data brokers. When I signed up and I saw the countless companies I've never heard of who all have my data, I was shook. Now I don't have to worry because I know Incogni's taking care of it. It's all totally safe, Incogni's from the guys behind Surfshark, so if you want to secure your data, if you even just want some digital peace of mind, follow the link in the description and sign up now. The first hundred people to use my code garbage at checkout get 20% off. So yeah, go check it out. It's a super cool tool. Anyway, back to what I learned from my anonymous source. So a lot of people, a lot of fans just kind of assume that when a new Marvel cartoon is made, it was because some executive at Marvel's decided it's time for another Spidey cartoon, another Avengers show, another X-Men show, to tie into this or that, to preserve brand relevancy or whatever. And that is sometimes how it goes, but not always. Sometimes an external company or production house will come to Marvel, will make a deal, get a license, and a show 
will start that way. Sometimes that external player will handle certain aspects of the development and the pre-production rather than Marvel just doing all this stuff in-house. According to my source, that's where the trouble started. Wolverine and the X-Men began with a couple of companies, First Serve International and Toons India, coming together, securing some investors, getting some money on board, then going to Marvel about a new X-Men show, getting that license, and hiring Kickstart Entertainment to house the show's pre-production, sorting out directors, designers, colorists, that sort of thing. But from the start, Kickstart kind of made a meal out of this. I'm told there were clashing visions, the investors wanting one type of show, Marvel wanting another, there was miscommunication, and just poor planning. For instance, apparently character designers were contracted and then dropped after their designs got approved, only to be rehired when it became clear that consistency in design philosophy was kind of important to an animated project. Maybe this was a deliberate attempt at cutting corners, at cheaping out, maybe it was simply incompetence. If you go to their website today, to the animation subsection, Wolverine and the X-Men is the oldest listed project. It may well be that at this point, Kickstart simply didn't know how to handle the early phases of cartoon production. As the project started getting off the ground after those initial hurdles, difficulties continued. I heard about staff members getting moved around between different roles, different responsibilities, getting dropped, replaced. I heard about multiple different designers, each getting promised the first crack at the same characters. My source noted that all this was going on while the show's writers, figures like Craig Kyle, Greg Johnson, Chris Yost, Joshua Fine, were turning in A-list scripts to a less than A-list system. But supposedly there was even some level of disagreement inside the writer's room. My source clarified that this discord behind the scenes was way more logistical, corporate, managerial than it was creative, but even so, it seemed like some writers had different priorities. Kyle, for instance, seemed more interested in focusing on X-Men elements from the 80s and 90s, Sinister, Genosha, and so on, while others were more interested in breaking new ground. The end result of all this was, allegedly, a production environment that was beginning to be seen as something of an embarrassment. And according to my source, despite good numbers and a solid reception, that was ultimately the main reason a second season never materialized. There may have been some corporate issues, problems with funding flow and so forth, but as far as my guy knew, as far as the perception among the show's production staff went, Marvel wanted the Disney acquisition to go smoothly, and it was easier to just axe the show to shove this mess under the proverbial rug. They didn't want the buyers thinking they didn't run a tight ship. Having this dysfunctional production clunking away in the background just wouldn't have looked very good to Disney, and that was the final nail in the coffin. That is why Wolverine and the X-Men died. And according to my source, it was doomed from the start. Or was it? Sure, that picture did seem to line up broadly with the far more vague comment I'd received beforehand, but it didn't jive with anything I'd seen elsewhere. And besides, no one person is ever going to know the whole story. So in order to get another perspective on this, I did something I'd been wanting an excuse to do for ages, and I reached out to Joshua Fine on Twitter. As mentioned above, Fine was in the writer's room for this show, and he contributed to a wealth of other animated projects around this time. On Wolverine and the X-Men, he started off in a more junior role, but by the time of that abortive second season, he was one of the folks heading up development. To my delight, he agreed to have a chat about the show and its untimely end. But the look I got from him about the show's end, well, it was different again. I put the above narrative to Josh, and he didn't agree. I think that's categorically false. As far as I know, like, a lot of people think that Disney buying Marvel is the reason that the show got canceled. And that is not the case. Remember I mentioned earlier that projects like this saw Marvel collaborate with external production houses? With Wolverine and the X-Men, Josh was firmly on the Marvel end of this partnership, and from that perspective, the show's production was generally smooth sailing. I know behind the scenes things were bumpy in, in the pre-production, but working out of the Marvel offices, we weren't super privy to all of that, and it you know, the show went forward, everything ran somewhat smoothly for season one. Depends where you're sitting. If yeah. you're sitting at Marvel with me, then the atmosphere was fine. It was a fairly harmonious process in the writer's room, too. I mean, it was Craig and Greg's show, really. They pushed it along in the direction that they wanted to take it, and there, there weren't that many other voices involved with the storytelling. Um, honestly, I probably had the strongest pushback on, on some stuff, um, but... 
I don't think that there were any major storytelling disagreements. It wasn't as though the atmosphere, the process, was even worsening during the move from season one's production to season two. Season two actually seemed to be going much more smoothly than season one did until there was no money for anything. According to Josh, the reason things eventually clattered to a halt was simply that the funds had stopped flowing, that the partnership between First Serve International and Toons India was running dry. There is a bit more to it than this. When that happened, there was some talk about trying to turn Wolverine and the X-Men into a self-funded project, doing it all in-house. So at that point, we had moved over to funding shows ourselves with Avengers or Earth's Mightiest Heroes and Superhero Squad. We had, we had started doing things in-house the way that our live action counterparts had, as opposed to licensing the shows out. And there was some talk to see whether we could turn Wolverine and the X-Men into an internal production. The reason that we didn't ultimately is, is because of the... Um, the bad blood between Marvel and Fox. Turns out that fan speculation was onto something. While the Marvel-Fox rivalry wasn't the reason the show was cancelled, it did perhaps contribute to the corporate reluctance to seek alternate funding arrangements to revive it afterwards. Over time, it just got to the point where Marvel was willing to cut off their nose to spite their face, like just bury the X-Men and stop promoting them as a property and don't give Fox any more material to adapt for their stuff. Trying to convince people to pay for it ourselves was a non-starter. What I wasn't hearing much about here was any of that corporate dysfunction, any of the tension between investors, Kickstart, and Marvel, any of that clunkiness. So I asked Josh if that could have been something felt more on the non-Marvel side of things. And yeah, I'm I'm aware that some stuff was probably bumpy during the pre-production of season one. Um, you know, I also have talked to people that worked over there and said it wasn't such a great time. Maybe there was a way to reconcile these two fairly different accounts then. Maybe there was a messy environment over on the kickstart side of things, caused by cheapness or inexperience, problems starting in pre-production and intensifying throughout, and maybe Marvel's awareness of this, their embarrassment, was one of the reasons they didn't try to move past that Fox bad blood here. Because such a loss of face wouldn't be worth it for a show so troubled. I asked Josh what he thought about this possibility. To be perfectly blunt about it, yeah. animation was always kind of like the redheaded stepchild at Marvel. I don't think I don't think it played into it at all. It's worth stressing at this point that nobody who spoke to me had any reason to lie. And okay, I'm hardly Charlie Kale, but I really did get the impression both of the people I'd spoken to in depth had done their best to share the truth, the real history, at least as they saw it. But where do you go from this? How do you mediate two differing accounts to get something resembling a clear, accurate picture of what went down? In the end, it came down to me to puzzle this out, so I gave it a go. I did a bit of digging into the corporate side of things. Now, I am just a man with Google, so this is hardly super sleuthing, but I wanted to try and find out a bit more about those funding problems. The first thing I learned was that from the looks of things, First Serve Toons, the partnership between First Serve International and Toons India, to which Marvel had granted this show's license, hadn't done anything since Wolverine and the X-Men. That in itself wasn't necessarily a bombshell. The intention may always have been to team up just the once, so I kept looking. Turns out Toons India, one half of that partnership, is still about. And nearly 15 years after the project wrapped up, they still proudly display Wolverine and the X-Men footage on their website's homepage. The other half, though, First Serve International, that's a different story. I really struggled to find anything on these guys. No press release about them ceasing operations, no reports of the same, no anything, really, beyond a few basic information listings like this. But I'm not just a man with Google, I'm also a man with Google Maps. These pictures were taken last year, so as of last year, First Serve International's offices don't appear to be there at any of the company's registered addresses. Indeed, practically every mention of First Serve International I could find dates back to their involvement with Wolverine and the X-Men, including this charming article from before the show aired, which seems to assume it'll be about actual Wolverines. But it's like this company dropped off the face of the Earth around 40 years back. Or, you know, more likely, what we're seeing, or I guess not seeing here, is the end result of those funding problems Josh and the others were on the receiving end of. It seems like this half of First Serve Toons just went bust, and Wolverine and the X-Men was a casualty of this. 
Does this make sense, though? A company surfacing, getting a deal with Marvel, then going under after producing just one season? Well, maybe. One thing Josh had mentioned to me when discussing the partnerships external companies form with Marvel for projects like Wolverine and the X-Men was that it wasn't always driven specifically by the desire for short-term gains. That some companies, maybe newer ones, would try to get a project done with your Marvels or your DCs for the prestige of it, to get some animation clout. A big swing like this would have looked good on their resume, if making that swing hadn't seemingly bankrupted them. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is skill issue? No, but seriously, let's try and line up everything we've heard and found, and form a picture of what happened. First Serve Tunes, a partnership of companies trying to get into the big leagues, managed to get a license from Marvel. Not just any license, but an X-Men license. On their end, that decision may have been a smart one in the short run, given the then high profile of that team, but maybe less so in the long run, given that the X men were already becoming a point of contention between Marvel and Fox. It seems like some elements of this partnership, at least, were fairly new to the animation biz. And it also seems like the studio they hired for pre-production, Kickstart, might have been too. Maybe this is part of what my anonymous source had meant by claiming the project was doomed from the beginning. Either way, they definitely ran pre-production in an amateurish way, and due to either this inexperience or cheapness, maybe even some combination of the two, projects and staff weren't handled well. A bad work environment formed and got worse. Despite this, things did get done, and when designs and animations trickled through to the Marvel side of things, there wasn't really cause for concern. So to someone in Kickstart, these problems might have seemed like a bigger, more embarrassing deal than they were to the bigwigs over at Marvel. Season 1 managed to get done without any catastrophic setbacks, but then two things happened. Disney's acquisition of Marvel got underway, and First Serve International ran out of money. Maybe they'd bitten off more than they could chew. Maybe their investors simply lost confidence. Maybe their investors lost confidence because they'd bitten off more than they could chew. Whatever the reason, First Serve International, half of First Serve Tunes, went bye-bye. So did their offices, so did their money, and as a result, so did Wolverine and the X-Men. In theory, Marvel could have stepped in, could have moved heaven and earth to save the show, to take it in-house and fund it themselves. The legal situation, the way the distribution deals had all been set up, meant that this was more feasible than it might have been. But because relations with Fox had deteriorated, because propping up an X-Men show would benefit their corporate enemies just as much as it would them, Marvel didn't really have much of an incentive to do this. Maybe some of the higher-ups at Marvel knew how messy things had been at Kickstart, but even if so, this wouldn't have been what stopped the two companies from breaking bread. The corporate Cold War was on another level of importance entirely. Similarly, while a dysfunctional production environment might not have looked great for Marvel, the problems were off at Kickstart, an external company. Even if the Disney buyers had found out about it, it wouldn't really have been their concern. So, what killed Wolverine and the X-Men? Well, it wasn't Disney. And it wasn't even related to Disney. They're not the villains here. They are in plenty of other cases, but not this one. The buyout of Marvel had a lot of consequences, many less than positive, but this wasn't one of them. And while the Marvel-Fox feud was a reason the show never got revived, it wasn't why it died. No, the reason isn't so dramatic. The money ran out. Maybe with all the inexperience at play here, that was always inevitable. Maybe a house built on sand, or rather by inexperienced builders, is always gonna collapse sooner or later. But the villain here isn't Disney, isn't Fox, isn't Marvel, and it doesn't even seem to be poor management over at Kickstart. It's a villain at once mundane and abstract. A company failed. Where was their money coming from and why did it stop? I doubt we'll ever know. It's the type of thing that happens every day, everywhere. The only difference in in this case is that the effects were felt by X-Men fans instead of stockbrokers and finance journalists. For someone some distance up the corporate ladder, this stopped being profitable, so it stopped. Capitalism bad, commodification of art, etc. Wolverine and the X-Men died as it was born, as part of First Serve International's portfolio. Or, I guess, as the portfolio. Maybe that makes it even more special that in spite of this show's very dry, very corporate life and death, in spite of some messy business behind the scenes, it was good that the hard work of countless gifted creatives resulted in a show whose artistic successes are remembered long after First Serve's monetary failures have been utterly forgotten. Maybe it's made even more tragic by the fact that a resurrection of this show was possible, held back by spite and greed. But 
Either way, at least now, finally, we know what happened. And we know that this claim on the Wikipedia article is wrong. Wikipedia, please fix. Cheers for watching this video. If you know anyone who watched this show back in the day, who never knew why it ended, maybe shoot them a link. And like I do every time I make a video about any of these old, so-called Yoast first shows, there are still some fans clamoring for revivals, so go follow this Twitter account if you want to join in with their efforts. I did ask Josh what he thought about fan campaigns like this, too. I... so I have not heard anything, I can tell you that, very honestly. Uh, I don't think I am particularly likely to ever hear anything, but... <laughs> That being said, I, you know, I've seen crazier things happen in this industry, um, shows that were long dead or being revived. If the 90s X-Men animated series can suddenly be, you know, resurrected from the ashes, then anything's possible. And the only way that it could possibly happen is for fans to continue to, to push for it. Um, uh, I know I've said, and uh, many of the other creatives that worked on the show have said that if something were to happen, that we would be, you know, open to coming back and and working on it again. Um, other than that, there's, you know, there's not too much that somebody like me can do. It it just has to come from the fan base and. They've got to make enough noise to convince Disney that it's something worth doing, that people want, that would get eyeballs, and um, yeah, I guess that's all there is to say about it. And if you want to stay up to date with what I'm working on, you know, I'm on Twitter too, at Pillar Garbage. And hey, same goes for Josh Fine. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh underscore Fine, and uh, I will be honest, I don't i don't use twitter a ton but i do try to answer questions when they're sent to me there so if you have any burning questions you can send them my way and i will try to respond to you otherwise use the phoenix force to utterly destroy that like button consider checking out incogni through the link down below if you want to protect your personal data online and i'll say farewell with special thanks as always going to my patreon supporters on screen now especially daniel goldhorn heather long and ryan emily